I'm mindful of the time. I'm just going to ignore it, though. <laughs> Thank you. I got one amen in the house. <laughs> and, a, and a lot of nervous chuckles. Amen and amen. No, I'll, I'll make good use of the time. But we do have to have a little bit of word, right? Got to have some bread of life. Glory to God. So if you have your Bibles with you, lift it up and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I'll never, never, never doubt that word because it is the word of God. I've got ears to hear, heart to receive. So teach to me the word of faith. Say, I believe it. I receive it right now in my life, in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. Today is the day of Pentecost. Every day is the day of Pentecost in my life. <laughs> I'm Pentecostal. How about you? I'm a spirit-filled believer. I'm a Pentecostal believer. I am anointed by the Holy Spirit. God has called me to walk in victory. You too. Glory to God. We should be people of determination. We are determined to walk in the blessings of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because we've been given a covenant, a blood covenant that lays out and reveals the blessings of God that God desires to get into our lives. Praise the Lord. And we're anointed to have them. Praise God. So today is Pentecost Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to go back about 2,000 years and get down to the roots of what the uh, Pentecost Sunday, Pentecost experience means for the church. So turn with me to Luke chapter 24. We'll begin in verse 49. Jesus in a, post, uh, in a post-resurrection appearance to the church declares, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Everybody say endued with power from on high. One, two, three. Endued with power from on high. Jesus said, I don't want you to go anywhere. I want you to tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are empowered, until you are endued with power from on high. So it is a supernatural endowment from heaven. It's not something that man manufactures. It is something that is imparted to you. You didn't make it up. You got it from heaven. From the Father. It's the promise of the Father that is given to you as a believer. Now look in Acts chapter 1 verse 4. This is a parallel passage. Luke wrote the gospel of Luke. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. So when he talks about the promise, he's talking about the same thing from Luke's to the book of Acts. Acts 1 verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For John, John the Baptist, for John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So John the Baptist baptized in water, Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Now look in verse 8 of Acts 1, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So when you receive this endowment of power from heaven, you will be a witness unto Jesus. Now that witness unto Jesus doesn't just mean that you'll talk about Jesus or share the gospel but you will do things the way Jesus did things. That when people look at you, they'll see him. That the ministry of Christ will be manifest in you by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You say, I could never do what Jesus did. No, Jesus said that you could do what Jesus did. Because in John 14, he said, the works that I do shall you also do, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. Well, he went to the Father to send back the anointing, to send back the mighty baptism with the Holy Spirit. And the church said, amen. 
Now, this did happen to the church on the day of Pentecost. And this is why we call it the Pentecostal experience. And the day of Pentecost refers to a feast that came 50 days after the feast of Passover. It is the harvest feast. It also recognized when Moses got the law from Mount Sinai. Pentecost means 50 days after. 50 days after Passover came the feast of Pentecost. And that is when the church was gathered together. They're going to be anointed with the Spirit for the grand harvest of souls for the world. So it makes absolute sense that the Spirit it would be poured out on the feast or the day of Pentecost because it is for the harvest of souls that we are a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Acts chapter 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, the church, were all with one accord in one place in the upper room, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now remember, Jesus said, wait ye in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Well, here it comes from heaven, glory to God. A sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire, and one, and, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they are baptized with the Holy Spirit at this point. Now we remember in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist, in referring to the ministry of Christ, he said, I baptize with water, but there is one who is coming after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Hallelujah. So the ministry of Christ is to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. That the Spirit of God poured out by Jesus from the throne rooms of heaven, the promise of the Father came into the church, filled the church, empowered the church that we can be witnesses unto Christ. So the current day ministry of Jesus Christ is baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he is our high priest. Yes, he is our advocate. Yes, he is the king of the kingdom. There are many, many, many things that Jesus is, but one of them is baptizer with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus desires that each and every believer is baptized with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I need a better amen. Because when Peter said, in explaining this miraculous, wonderful event, when thousands of people came running to hear and see what was going on, people speaking with other tongues, Peter, the preacher of Pentecost, stood up and said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Well, are we in the last days? Yes, we are. We are in the last days. He's pouring out his spirit. He hasn't stopped pouring out his spirit. He will continue to pour out his spirit upon his young men, upon the old men, upon the handmaids. Glory to God. And the young men will have visions and the old men will dream dreams and they will prophesy. Hallelujah. Thank God for it. So this is an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing experience for the church. Some would say that it has passed away, but it has not. Why would God give the mighty baptism with the Holy Spirit, glory to God, to the first church, the early church? The book of Acts only covers about 30 years of church history. Why would he give it to the first church and then take it away? It's the promise of the Father, Jesus, I mean, Peter said it's going to happen in the last days. We're still in the last days. And if we are going to minister the way Jesus ministered, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And Jesus ministered in power. 
Jesus ministered by the anointing. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Everything that Jesus did, he did by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus wants us to do it exactly the same way, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Well, bless the Lord. Well, I want to do that too. Glory to God. Now, John said something very, very interesting in Matthew 3 and 11. John said, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Everybody say fire. fire. Don't forget the fire. Amen. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we see in the upper room that there were tongues of fire divided throughout the room and it sat upon each of the 120 in attendance that day. And they all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there was a tongue of fire sitting upon each and every believer in that upper room. And that should not surprise us because on when God dedicates a house of worship, when God dedicates a temple, when God dedicated the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness, on the day of dedication, you'll read that fire fell from heaven onto the altar, come on, and it burned up the offering, and then the priests were in charge of keeping the fire going. So it started with a divine outpouring of fire upon the altar, and then the priests had to keep it going. It happened in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And then when Solomon dedicated Solomon's temple, fire fell from heaven onto the altar once again on the day of dedication. Well, Solomon's temple was destroyed, but the human temple, this temple, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, we read by Paul. When God dedicated a brand new temple, the human temple, because under the new covenant, he wants to live in you. Not just be on you, but in you. Glory to God. When God dedicated a new temple, he poured out fire from heaven once again. And it landed upon the altars of our heart. Glory to God. And on that day of dedication, we see the tongues of fire settling upon the new temple, the human temple, where the Spirit of God resides. And it's our job to keep the fire going. I said, it's our job to keep the fire going. God poured it out on the day of Pentecost, but the church has to keep it going. Come on now. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost and fire. Now, fire does three things. One, fire will eat up the offering it will eat up the flesh of the offering. Number two, fire will refine or purify everything that it touches. And number three, God speaks through the fire. So number one, fire consumes the flesh of the sacrifice. Number two, fire refines, and we're talking about divine fire now, refines such as gold and silver, but particularly your heart. Hallelujah. And number three, God speaks through fire. Well, I want to very, very briefly run through these. Number one... When you're talking about an offering, when they would bring an offering to the Lord, Jesus was our offering to the Lord, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They would bring a lamb before the Lord and they would lay that lamb as a burnt offering upon the altar. Now the blood of the lamb would cleanse or cover your sins in the Old Testament. It would cover, they would take the blood and they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat or on the altar and it would cover the sin. The body of the lamb or the flesh of the lamb would be wholly and completely burnt up by the fire. It would be consumed by the fire. So there would be nothing left of that lamb. It was judged by the fire, but the blood covered the sin. 
Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. So when you're talking about a burnt offering, and the word burnt offering in the original language literally means to ascend or to go up in smoke. And it meant in Leviticus 1 and 9, a soothing aroma unto the Lord. It was the complete destruction of the animal. The lamb was laid upon the altar and the lamb was destroyed. Why? Because that lamb was your substitute. It was the substitute of the sinner. So the sinner didn't have to be destroyed. The offering was destroyed. Glory to God. Now, we are told that we are a living sacrifice in Romans chapter 12. Present your bodies, 12 and 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So, the fire falls from heaven, the fire falls upon the altar of our heart, what are we going to lay upon the altar? Come on, church. What are we going to lay upon the altar? Our flesh. The lamb represents the flesh. The flesh represents not just your sin, but just fleshly ways. Doubt, unbelief, fear, old ways of thinking. Come on. Everything that doesn't line up with the Word of God. Those are the kinds of things that we're supposed to be laying upon the altar and letting the fire completely destroy them. Amen. Thoughts of fear, thoughts of negativity, thoughts of doubt, thoughts of I can't, I won't, I never will, thoughts of lack and limit and loss, thoughts of fear and doubt and limit and the whole spectrum of things that are contrary to the will of God. Well, we are to take those things as the Spirit falls upon us and the fire resides upon the altar of our heart. When we have that negative thought, we're to take that negative thought and immediately put it upon the altar. Burn it up, Lord. Come on now. Somebody help me preach this. Fear, put it on the altar. Doubt, put it on the altar. Negativity, put it on the altar. Fleshly passion, put it on the altar. Sin, put it on the altar. Come on. Everything that doesn't line up with the word or the will of God in your life, put it on the altar. Fortunately, you got the altar in your heart. You're carrying it with you. So when that negative thought and that doubt and that unbelief and that I can't and I won't and I never will pops into your head, you stop right there for You say, nope, that's going on the altar. I said, that's going on the altar. Glory to God. The problem that we have sometimes is that we want to lay the lamb on the altar, but hang on to a lamb chop. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> because there's some things that taste pretty good. <laughs> there's some things that just kind of fit our appetite. Come on. There, there's some things that we like and we want to gnaw on it for a little bit longer. And so we're willing to lay most of it on the altar, but I'm going to hang on to that lamb chop. <laughs> Amen. Because it makes me happy. Because it feeds my flesh. And I don't want to let it go. I wish somebody would help me preach this message today. I'm just, I'm just going to hang on to the, this little thing, and I'm just going to gnaw on it until I get down to the bone, and then I'm going to chew on the bone a little bit longer. And the Spirit of God says, no, no, lay it on the altar. Put it on the altar. Let it go. Come on now. Let it go. Glory to God. <laughs> Romans 6 and 13. Present your members. Present them before God as a living sacrifice, as yourself being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness before God. So everybody say this out loud with me. I'm going to take all of the flesh, all the negativity, all the doubt and unbelief. I'm going to lay it on the altar. Say, burn it up. Burn it up. Hallelujah. Second thing the fire does, it, it refines. 
And John the Baptist, when he was talking about Jesus, he was really fulfilling prophecy. And we go back to Malachi chapter 3 to see this. Malachi 3 and 2. And he's talking about the refiner's fire who can endure the day of his coming, who can stand when he appears. For he is like the refiner's fire and the launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, purge them as gold and silver, and they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. So the fire refines and the fire purifies. Now, very often we talk about the refining fires as trials and tribulations, and those can refine us. But Jesus may test us, but he's not going to put us through trial and tribulation. The devil takes care of all that kind of stuff. What Jesus does by the fire of the Holy Spirit is to refine our faith. And you're doing it right now. As you are sitting under the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is ministering to you, and He is refining your faith. He is sharpening your faith. Come on now. He is refining your faith so that you say yes to the Word of God. You say, I receive that Word of God. That is my Word for my life. Glory to God. And it may be that there are some things that the Holy Spirit was revealing to us this morning about that lamb chop that we got to let it go. And the Holy Spirit ministers to us. And in the refining of our faith, we say, yep, I'm letting it go. I'm going to do what God is calling me to do. I'm going to live the way God is calling me to live. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He will refine and he will purify. Now, the word of God, the vision of God, the purpose of God, the calling of God needs a lot of refining in our life. As we go through our life, God is constantly refining us as to his calling upon our life. And that's why when you listen to people who talk about vision and mission and all that, they'll say, write the vision down. Even God said that, write the vision down, make it plain so that you can run with it. You write the vision down and then the next day, rewrite the vision. Next day, rewrite the vision. Next day, rewrite the vision. Why? Because every time you write the vision, it becomes clearer. Every time you write the vision, you refine it. Every time you write the vision, especially if you don't look back to what, the way you wrote it last time, but now you're writing it just from the way it's sitting on your heart. You're seeing that it is shaping, and it is maturing, and it is developing, and it is becoming more clear to you because the Holy Spirit, through His fire, is refining the calling of God on your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then finally, the Spirit of God speaks through the fire. Now, we're all familiar with the burning bush. When Moses was in Midian, God spoke to him about delivering his people, and he spoke through a burning bush. And if you'll turn back to Exodus chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert, he came to Horeb, the mount of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, Now I will turn aside and see the great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here, here I am. And he said to him, do not draw near this place, but take off your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen. Now, he is speaking this out of the burning bush. The fire was speaking to Moses. 
And the Lord from the fire said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. When the Spirit fell upon those in the upper room, those 120 believers in the upper room, they spoke through the fire. It said that they spoke with other tongues. And then it goes on to say that they prophesied. When the Spirit of God is falling on you, you will speak through the fire. Because the fire is the presence of God. And when the presence of God is powerful in your life, you will find yourself prophesying or speaking God's will or God's word over your life. They spoke in other tongues. Praise the Lord. Fire speaks. Everybody say that out loud. Fire speaks. Now, through the bush, God said, I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. As a pastor that ministered heavily to my heart as we're talking about the day of Pentecost and we're talking about God speaking through the fire because I do not think times have changed all that much. I think we're seeing some repeating of history and I think God is speaking to the church of Jesus Christ through the fire of the Holy Spirit because God says, I see oppression of my people who are in Egypt. God says, I hear their cry because of the taskmasters. I know their sorrows. We are living in an age, we are living in a time where the fire of God is speaking to the church again. And the church has to listen to the voice of God because God is saying, I hear your cries. I see your sorrows. There are taskmasters. Listen to me, church. There are taskmasters in the land that is a Oppressing the church that is oppressing God's people that is oppressing believers and God says listen my fire has a word of deliverance my fire has a word of deliverance for the church there are taskmasters in the land that is oppressing the word of God the people of God, the church of God, right now in this nation. Right now, there is a pro-abortion lobby that insists on full-term abortions. There's a pro-Hamas and anti-Israel lobby that is committed to the annihilation of Israel. There is a pro-transgender lobby that insists on transi trans uh, transitioning children and putting men in women's sports, putting men in women's locker rooms. There is an LGBT movement that insists on putting LGBT curriculum in schools. Just yesterday, I read an article that the Supreme, not the Supreme Court, but the Federal Court in Maryland said that parents of children ages kindergarten through fifth grade cannot opt their children out of brand new LGBT LGBT uh, curriculum in the public schools. There is a pro-open borders lobby that has led to lawlessness in our sanctuary cities. There is a politically correct movement that has led to cancel cultural movement that has led to the words are violence movement that defines the gospel uh, as hate speech. There is growing socialism. There is growing Marxism movements in academia. There is violent attacks on churches and synagogues. In fact, churches are the most 
violent places in most cities now that we are suffering more attacks than any other places in the cities. There is a weaponization of the legal system against churches and believers and conservatives that has led to a two-tier system of justice. There's an anti-traditional family movement that declares men are not necessary in homes and women that are homemakers are devalued. In fact, there was a young Catholic man who was the kicker on the Kansas City Chiefs team who gave a commencement speech at a Catholic university. And he said, young ladies, there is a calling on your life. You can look forward to be mothers. You can look forward to be homemakers without shame. And this country has excoriated him and rebuked him and wanted him kicked off the team. I say he's got the message that's coming from the the fire of the living God. What has happened to this nation? What has happened to this nation where the traditional family has been utterly dismantled in this nation and homemaking is now looked upon with scorn? The fake news. The fake news looks at every opportunity to criticize our faith. The Green New Deal has bankrupted this nation and has caused wars to crop up all throughout the globe. Now we see that our institutions are infected with this mind virus. Media is infected with this mind virus. Social networking platforms is infected with this mind virus. And now artificial intelligence is coming on line in every area in every area that you can think of I talked to a fellow that was getting in on the ground level of it he says you got to look out for artificial intelligence because the people who program it do not like God and the stuff that that artificial intelligence is going to pump out into every mode of technology that we have is going to be antichrist in nature there are taskmasters that are oppressing the church of jesus christ but i declare the fire the fire of god that is upon the altar has a voice for the church today hallelujah now, I'm going to wrap this up, but I've got to talk first about a biblical worldview. And this is very important, so hang with me. Are we doing okay? There are eight points, seven points to a biblical worldview. George Barna did a survey, and he said, Do you believe this or don't believe this? Here are the seven points of a biblical worldview. Believing God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, perfect, just, is the creator and eternal ruler of the world. And I say amen. amen. Number two, biblical worldview. Realizing that all humans are sinners in need of salvation. Amen. amen. Knowing that Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation through our confession of sin and reliance on his forgiveness. That was number three. Number four, believing the Bible is true, relevant words of God that serve as a moral guide. Here's number five, accepting the existence of absolute moral truth. Here's number six, acknowledging your purpose in life is knowing, loving, and serving God with all your heart and soul and strength. Here's number seven, understanding the genuine success in life is consistent obedience to God. Amen. And we say amen, amen, and amen, and amen. amen. This house of worship believes that. Yes. We believe that. Yes. But only 4% of the world does. 4% of our population, I should say the United States, 4% of the United States believes in a biblical worldview. Those in ages 18 to 29, and I think this survey was done in, in 2023. Those in ages 18 to 29, only 1%. 1%. Now, that seemed like a pretty low bar for me to believe the things of God. I'd have taken it a lot further than that. 1%. If you reduce the ages from 18 to 23, it's a half a percent, which is essentially none. 
Only 21% of those attending evangelical Protestant churches have a biblical worldview. Only 16% of those attending a Pentecostal church have a biblical worldview. Mainline Protestant churches, only 8% have a biblical worldview. That's according to the American Worldview Inventory in 2020. In the past 15 years, we have gone from 51% of pastors having a biblical worldview to 37% of pastors having a biblical worldview. Can you imagine having a pastor who doesn't believe the Bible? <laughs> well, apparently only about 37% of us do. That there are churches with steeples and stained glass windows that name Jesus, but they don't believe his word and will not sign on to a biblical worldview. So I have to ask, with all of the attacks on the church and every institution of our great land formed against us, standing against what we believe and criticize and ridiculing us, academia is against us, and media is against us, and technology is, is against us, and arts and entertainment is, is against us, and much of the business world is against us, and much of the government is against us, and even many of the churches now have walked away from the Lord with everything that is formed and standing against us. I have to ask, are we better off? No, no, we're not. We're falling apart. We are melting down. Our nation is in chaos. I read a most interesting thing about the great atheist Richard Dawkins. Have you heard of him? He's a Darwinian biologist, and he is great for debating uh, Christians and he is 100% opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But as he has watched this world fall apart, even he said, the West needs Christianity. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. This article in Christianity Today says, as Christianity continues to decline in the West, the broader world has begun to notice something's missing. There seems to be a growing awareness that, for all the scandals and failings of the church, the loss of a Christian culture leaves us all worse off, and that there are benefits to being a Christian and living in a Christian society. When you are, when you, uh, and then you have those who are like the former atheist, uh, Kershiali, explains their conversion to Christianity at least partly was in response to the decay of the contemporary world. The only credible answer, I believe, she says, lies in our desire to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. In an essay announcing her new faith, famous atheist Richard Dawkins says, well, I disagree with her conversion to the faith. However... He described himself as a cultural Christian. He says, I'm not going to give my heart to Jesus, but Christian society is the way to go. What these arguments have in common is the recognition that Christianity is tangibly good for the human person and society. It improves our mental health, our social networks. It gives us stability and order and a foundation for liberty and justice that the contemporary secular world can't replicate. These are powerful reasons to become a Christian and encourage the spread of at least a, a uh, modicum of Christian culture, one that assumes the ethos of Christianity, even if it doesn't accept the orthodoxy of Christianity. After all, the data seems clear. A more Christian cultural will produce more human flourishing. And that was in Christianity today. So, we live in a society that doesn't like us very much. 
and we don't have much influence on that society. About 4%. About 4%. But the church was born at a time when Rome ruled. And Rome hated the church. In fact, fed us to the lions. Look for every opportunity to hunt us down and to kill us. And yet, because the church was anointed by the Holy Spirit, the church flourished in an oppressive culture called the Iron Hand of Rome. I have to believe that that same anointing that was in the first church and is in today's church is given for us so that we can influence society more than society influences us. Do you believe that today? Did you get anything out of this today? Hallelujah.